I'm very happy to be back in your good company, and as many of you said, very early this morning. When I was preparing for this speech, I looked back at the themes of the last three conferences I attended. In 2014, it was differences. In 2016, it was the word we. And in 2018, it was together. Differences, we, together. These themes are highly relevant to our discussion today. Differences have come to define politics today. Across the world, existing fault lines have deepened and have been exploited. This, in turn, puts stress on the sense of we, stressing social cohesion and weakening mutual trust. And in many places, this has severely undermined society's ability to forge a common path forward. As Singapore is not immune from these pressures, the key imperative for our politics should be to manage our differences, expand our common purposes to engender a greater sense of we, and ensure that society can progress as one, together. I will address each of these themes in turn. The first word, differences. Over the last decade, many countries have seen their political consensus fracture. The state of the world did not used to be this way. After the Second World War, the major players in the world forged a new global order. The expansion of trade and investment enabled economic growth at an unprecedented pace. Global trade boomed, investments poured into developing countries, and billions of people saw their lives improve. Singapore is one of those countries that has benefited significantly from globalization. But the last decade has shown that not all countries have kept pace with the changes confronting them. In some societies, globalization has exposed workers to greater competition, while technological advancements has disrupted jobs and livelihoods. The developed world is feeling the competition as a number of developing economies, including those in Asia, move rapidly up the value chain. In some instances, these countries have leapfrogged the developed world in areas such as e-commerce and e-payments. Wealth and income inequality have grown, and the consequences have been more severe for countries that have failed to restructure their economies and upskill their workers. Societies with rapidly aging populations are feeling the strain because many pension plans are underfunded and welfare spending is at an unsustainable high. The ripple effects of these changes have resulted in many people becoming anxious and resentful. They have become increasingly pessimistic about their future and upset about the lack of progress in life. They have amplified much of their discontent on social media in narrow silos and echo chambers. More worryingly, they have come to view their governments and institutions with mistrust. This has ushered in an era of anti-politics. While we have fared better than most, we are not immune to the same divisive forces that have swept across the world. In fact, we have already seen some semblance of nativist tendencies here in Singapore, such as some of the public discourse around foreigners. If we do not act decisively, and if we allow these forces to creep up on us, our hopes and concerns can be exploited to create fear and anger. Our diversity can be turned against us, our unity can fray, and our society can wither. Therefore, as we close the decade, we need to bear in mind lessons such as the importance of making sure that differences do not become entrenched and corrode social cohesion, 
the dangers of political parties using divisive rhetoric to gain support in a fractured landscape and the risk of falling prey to the pool of populism. We cannot assume we will be immune. This brings me to the second word, we. Amid these disruptive forces, can Singapore be different? Can Singaporeans strengthen our sense of we in the coming decade and beyond? The notion of we as citizens of Singapore is relatively new. We are a young nation, and as our bicentennial last year reminded us, our present existence as a successful sovereign nation is a historical anomaly. Just because for most of our history, this place was part of larger kingdoms. We were buffeted by global and regional forces, and our fate was determined by powers beyond our control. Eventually, our self-determination set us on a different course. We became an independent nation, and we were able to find success as one united people. There are two key questions here. First, how did our forefathers beat the odds and turn an island of mud flats into a multicultural metropolis? And second, what must we do to keep our nation successful and sovereign? I believe a strong sense of we was key to this. Our improbable success was made possible by exceptional governance, capable leaders working together with a united people. In the decades after independence, our founding fathers fostered a sense of nationhood by introducing policies that gave people a stake in Singapore. They welcomed foreign investment and decided on the path of rapid industrialization. They invested heavily in education and ensured each generation had more opportunities than the last. Through the housing policies, our founding leaders turned the city of squatters and slums into a nation of homeowners in just a few decades. Together, these policies meant that every Singaporean, regardless of race, language or religion, had a chance to live well, age well, and a chance to make the future better for their children. This shared experience of progress united the founding generation of Singaporeans and strengthened the trust between the people and the government. Over time, a virtuous cycle was established the government had a strong mandate and was able to never stop planning for the future. They realised their bold political vision through sound, sustainable policies. In turn, Singaporeans trusted their leaders because they saw their lives improve in real ways and they had a strong sense of optimism for the future. This nurtured the reservoir of trust between Singaporeans and the government and this gave them the confidence to make sacrifices for the greater good and for future generations. This is a formula behind our success, and this has kept Singapore exceptional. This approach must remain core to the government's mission, especially as we grapple with longer-term issues facing us. In an era of rising inequality, we will strengthen our fundamentals and ensure no Singaporean is shut out of opportunities because of the family circumstances. That is why we have been increasing our investments in preschool education and doing more to level up children from disadvantaged backgrounds. In an age of disruption, we will step up efforts to encourage lifelong learning for our workers. We are currently developing the next bound of skills future and will make a further push to help workers pick up new skills and seize new opportunities. One such group are those in their 40s and 50s. Some among them completed their education more than two decades ago and might not have had the opportunity to upskill. 
In a period of widening generational divides, we must continue to give hope to our young. Public housing will continue to remain accessible and affordable to all Singaporeans. And as our people live longer and as our society ages, we will take care of older Singaporeans. Our seniors should not only have a roof over their heads, but also have enough for retirement and their health care needs. The Pioneer and Medica Generation packages were tailored to help older cohorts meet their health care needs for life. We are now studying how we can better help lower and middle income Singaporeans, including current and future seniors, to meet their retirement needs in a sustainable way. I will provide more details in the coming budget. Our unity as a nation and as one people have been strengthened by our sense of shared mission. This was not achieved by closing ourselves off to the world or by looking inward. Instead, we, as we turn our gaze to the next decade and beyond, we must continue to be creative and agile in charting our way forward and we must stay open and connected. This is especially because in the coming years, we will be confronted by the continued strategic competition between the US and China, and an even swifter pace of change in the nature of jobs and the economy, and the rapid ageing of our society, and the increasing manifestation of existential threats like climate change. But there are bright spots. Southeast Asia is growing rapidly. Geographically and culturally, we are in a good position to contribute to the region's growth. More broadly, we are also well-placed to serve as a node between Asia and the world, as a global Asia node. As a small island nation, we are nimble. We are ready to innovate, testbed, and scale new solutions. In this way, we can continue to stay relevant to the world. And because we are small and non-threatening, we can be friends to all, even in a turbulent world. This is how we can turn our constraints into opportunities and create opportunities in the face of disruption. The way ahead will not be easy, but you have the unwavering commitment of the government and from the 4G leadership. My colleagues and I will make every effort to build a future of progress for Singaporeans in the coming decades. The differences and divisive forces I described earlier will continue to challenge our notion of we. But apart from these forces, Singaporeans ourselves are also becoming more diverse in terms of our needs, aspirations and views. Singaporeans born after independence do not share the bonds of war and struggle that the Pioneer Gen and Merdeka generations experience. The digital era has allowed for an exchange of diverse perspectives, but there has also been a proliferation of more extreme opinions and a narrowing of views in echo chambers. Our demographic profile is also changing. Last year, more than one in three citizen marriages involve transnational couples. In the face of all these changes, it's now even more crucial to maintain our sense of who we are as a people, focus on what we have in common and work together to build our shared future. How do we do this? We must first make sure that we continue to have strong political leadership. They must have the moral courage to do what is right for the people and not just what is popular. They cannot be all things to all people. Since our independence, Singaporeans have worked together with the political leaders to turn an improbable nation into a land of opportunities. 
We must continue to do the same by strengthening trust between the government and the people and also among Singaporeans. In this regard, what I learned during the 2012 Our Singapore Conversation exercise was both instructive and heartening. My experience working with Singaporeans showed me that they understand the trade-off and the need to make hard decisions for the collective good. Some may not think much about what we have achieved together, but I believe our people can see, understand and draw their own conclusions. They can see that the government will always strive to understand their needs and concerns, work hard to address them and deliver on our promises. We are upfront about the hard truths facing Singapore and also about mistakes, even if they are politically inconvenient. Nevertheless, in a society increasingly flooded by misinformation, by information and misinformation, it is critical that we find ways to deepen understanding and relationships among our people and to redouble our efforts to maintain a balanced perspective. We must reject extremist views that will fray our social fabric and be discerning about falsehoods and irresponsible promises that cannot be fulfilled. Most importantly, we must find new ways to come together, affirm what we hold in common and work collectively towards a shared future. This is why I launched the Singapore Together Movement in June last year. I believe that each of us can make a difference. And by acting together, we can make a bigger difference and achieve what may seem daunting or impossible. Therefore, my 4G colleagues and I are committed to go beyond just working for you to working with you to build our future Singapore. We want to mobilise the passion, creativity and can-do spirit of Singaporeans as we find common cause, experiment with new ideas and solutions and beat the odds together. Our partnership efforts have gained momentum over the last six months. First, we are opening up several areas for Singaporeans to get directly involved in designing policies and putting them into action. We started new platforms like the Citizens Panel and Citizens Work Group, where we engage Singaporeans on their ideas about making different aspects of life better, such as improving work-life harmony and encouraging household recycling. The ideas are well thought out and we are working to put their ideas into action. We are also involving Singaporeans in directly shaping our fiscal environment. This includes the Somerset Belt, our parks, and also the Geelong Sarai Cultural Precinct, which I visited over the weekend. Singaporeans of all ages will have a hand in developing ideas, evaluating the options, and shaping the eventual designs. Secondly, we have also been making a more concerted effort to engage Singaporeans on the upcoming budget. Just last weekend, I attended a session with youth leaders. We explored the challenges and opportunities for Singapore and how we can partner one another to create a better future for all. It was a rich learning experience for everyone and I certainly learned a lot. Third, Singaporeans are also sharing their ideas about making their home a better place and putting this into action. During our bicentennial year of commemoration, I attended many events by various religious groups, clans, schools, businesses and charities. I learned so much about the imagination and commitment of each group to uplift the lives of people they are serving. Businesses are also doing their part. In a span of three short years, the Company of Good Initiative has grown into a network of more than 1,400 companies. This network has enabled companies to learn from one another, to form partnerships and to bring corporate giving to the next level. Many Singaporeans are letting their actions speak for themselves. Total volunteer hours has increased from 45 million hours in 2008 to 122 million hours 
in 2018. And under SG Cares, there are many more opportunities to contribute than before. Singaporeans are gradually taking charge and doing good at all levels of society, each in their own way, mobilising the people around them to make Singapore a better place. The creativity, energies and commitment of our people is most inspiring. It encourages us to take the next steps to invite Singaporeans to tackle bigger challenges and seize more opportunities in the coming decades. What are some of these challenges and opportunities? Some are existential, like addressing climate change and rising sea levels. Others are issues that can benefit from fresh approach, such as how we can keep our seniors active and healthy as our lifespan increases. There are many possibilities for us to work together, such as keeping Singapore safe and secure, developing the full potential of our people, growing our economy to create more opportunities and resources for our people, or making sure Singapore will become a green, sustainable and livable city, and building a caring, cohesive community. I'm inviting all Singaporeans to work with us and with each other on these key challenges and opportunities. And we'll announce more details in the coming months. These are early days of our Singapore Together movement. What we see forming is a new model of partnership between governments and Singaporeans in owning, shaping and acting on our future. In this process, government agencies are learning to develop and deliver policy solutions in a more collaborative manner. At the same time, Singaporeans too are gaining a deeper appreciation of the challenges and trade-offs in making national policy. And collectively, we are learning to understand different viewpoints, to distinguish truth from falsehoods, and to find a way forward in the midst of diverse and often conflicting opinions. However, the government will continue to exercise leadership in areas where we are expected to, such as in security and defence, and ensuring that we act decisively when the situation demands and we plan and act for the long term. Above all, I'm confident that our partnership efforts to date will set the foundations for the work of a generation. Just as our founding fathers made home ownership their cornerstone policy to give Singaporeans a stake in Singapore and a share in our progress, Singapore together will be our new cornerstone of nation building, a way of working that reflects and strengthens our shared ownership of Singapore's future. So let me conclude. Our approach to politics and governance has served us well over the past 55 years. As we embark on a new decade, we'll face a world marked by differences. As a small nation, we will be buffeted by these forces. We must continue to work with like-minded countries to bridge divides between countries and to tackle global common challenges. There is no doubt that our sense of unity as one people and our cohesion as a nation will be tested. But I'm confident that going forward, Singapore can continue to excel and thrive and shine brighter as a little red dot. Singapore together, this is our way forward, our way of ensuring that as we progress together and that the benefits of progress are felt by all Singaporeans. Our way of harnessing diversity as strength so that we are greater than the sum of our parts. Our way of creating a shared future and finding common ground so that we remain united as one people. Our way of ensuring Singapore remains exceptional as we ride the winds of uncertainty and waves of disruption. I invite all Singaporeans to join us on this journey as we continue to chart our shared future together. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your views during the dialogue.
DPM, you spoke about the challenges that we will face in the foreseeable future. Define in one sentence, if you can, what is our biggest political challenge? So in the midst of all these very major changes that are going on around us, the question is, as I alluded to in my speech, uh, will we stay together? By staying united, Singaporeans have shown time and again that we can beat the odds and continue to be exceptional. So the one sentence is, can we stay united and draw strength from our diversity, draw strength from each other so that we can continue to progress together? Thank you. Uh, first question, uh, Professor Paul Tambia. Good morning, DPM. Uh, I'm going to ask you a slightly harder question than what Janatas asked. <laughs> so, um, GST has been acknowledged universally as a regressive tax. In Singapore, we pay GST on medications. We even pay GST on the water con conservation tax, which is probably the only place in the world where you pay tax twice on, on something like water. So my question is whether your government had considered alternatives to raising the GST for raising revenue. For example, uh, returning the top corporate uh, tax level to 20%, which is what it was before year of assessment 2017, or perhaps even taxing unearned income, such as uh, the estate duty where it was about uh, 12 years ago. Thank you. I think our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, has said that uh, we, the Singapore Pledge, we the citizens of Singapore, which you mentioned just now, is only an aspiration. While we all continue to work hard on it to make it a reality, not only a reality but sustainability, what are these challenges? And my question is, are we managing the differences well? Managing differences is not just about opposition politicians, but people who differ in our views. Are we doing enough in managing those differences in order to remain united? And more than just a question of social cohesion and inequalities. Thank you. Well, uh, first, Mr. Portenbayer's question about is GST regressive. I would like to correct you on that, that it is important for us to consider our tax system as a whole and not to pick on one or two piece and say, well, this part is regressive, this part is not progressive, and so on. Because what we collect in GST has also to be seen, A, against other taxes, and B, against the spending. And in fact, we have deliberately, uh, we have been very careful in designing the policies to make sure that the benefits of our tax system and of many of the schemes that we have benefit the lower income groups, the ones who need help the most. And there's another aspect which uh, Mr. Portamba may want to uh, remember that GST is not just paid by Singaporeans. It's paid by everyone in Singapore uh, when they consume services, when they uh, buy certain goods. So if you consider in totality, in fact, the GST system Contrary to how it is always, if you look at the raw numbers, it looks like, yes, it is, uh, it may look regressive, but it is not. And you have, cannot pick one piece and forget about all the other bits. And there is another aspect which I think is worth bearing in mind, that the largest source of revenue for the government, it is an element called NIRC, or net investment returns contributions. Now, I would like everyone to think about this and reflect on this. A country with no oil, no gas, no diamond, no minerals, in fact, nothing which started so poor, has today a net of return from our invest, own 50% of our returns from past investments that now contributes more than GST, more than personal income tax, more than corporate income tax. So let us bear that in mind 
and be responsible in how we safeguard this for our future generation. And that is why I emphasise the need for us to keep thinking long term. And finally, you ask, why can't we increase other taxes? Surely, uh, you know, we must consider all possible options. Now, you look at uh, what has uh, happened recently. You know, America has reduced its uh, corporate income taxes. And in fact, uh, globally, there is also uh, increasing debate on what is a fair rate of tax that companies around the world should be paying. And if you are a company headquartered in country A, why are you not paying more taxes in country A? If you are a company selling to country B, why are you not paying taxes to country B? And this is a, a global, uh, almost a global tax competition that is going on because some countries, especially the more developed ones, feel that we are not getting our fair share of taxes. So we must be very careful that what we do do not in the end harm our future because it is easy to say, let me increase taxes on uh, corporates, let me increase taxes on individuals. But many of these are mobile and if they move out, Singaporeans, will be, we are going to be the ones who suffer the unemployment and, and the slower growth. The Ambassador Zainu's question about the managing differences and not just for politicians. I'll say that um, your point, you are pointing to a, a broader set of issues about whether do we have enough diversity of views? Right? Are we considering diverse views? And I'll say that, in fact, uh, even in the, I would say even in this room, this is an IPS crowd. These are people who come for IPS seminar. You are very interested in policies. I'm quite certain that even in this room, if we were to do some polls and some uh, measures, you will have very different uh, points of view. The important thing is to make sure that we have the same sets of facts and we base our arguments on the same sets of facts and on, on truth that we can agree on and look at what are those creative ways in which we can solve a problem. And in fact, Singapore together, one of the objectives is precisely for that. There are many different ways for us to achieve an objective, which is better, which is uh, more sustainable, and this is something which we can discuss. Hello, Mr. Thi, uh, Go Ming Singh. From yeah. People's Power Party. Yeah. All right. Um, you talk about uh, diversity force, and you talk about national identity. Well, if you go back to the founding years of Singapore, we actually face uh, diversity forces also. Because of, after the war, we have a nationalism that comes out from the communist China, Malaysia, right? And we have a big problem to deal with it back then. But after 30 years, we have integrated as a core. Now, my question is, the diversity force actually is coming back again. By statistics, when we looked at even from 2007 up to recently, 2019, we are giving out about 20,000 new citizenship from different countries, especially the mainland China and Malaysia, again, and um, India, right, and Philippines. Now, with the geopolitics, changes with a rising of a Chinese um, dominance in the region. Where will they stand when we have to make a difficult decision in geopolitics? For example, you may give citizenship to people to mainland China, but they will always have this call, what we Chinese call Qing Yi Jie, Zhong Guo Qing Yi Jie. Allegiance, allegiance will not change overnight, right? Will this affect our policies, our political direction and the decision that we made? And will they actually exert their, their thoughts to be pro-China 
or to be pro Philippines. Okay. Pro India. Let me address Mr. Goming Singh's question about whether having, you know, the new citizens will end up as a sort of new divisive force. Now, the, in fact, it can be if we exploit it and start casting doubt on the uh, loyalties and on the fitness of new citizens or that we create a new divide. As I mentioned in my speech earlier, one in three marriages today involve a Singaporean and a citizen of another country. And we must bear in mind that for those people who have become Singapore citizens, they have become citizens by conviction. They have left their country and decided that Singapore is a better place for them and their children in the future. So we should, as Singaporeans, make the best effort to integrate them, to integrate them into our society, to welcome them, so that they can be part of our team. And in that regard, I must say that I'm very um, troubled that so many uh, people are seeking to exploit these differences Instead of making the effort to integrate them, they have made this into an issue. And they have made this into, you are not taking care of Singaporeans. You are not taking care of Singaporeans' interests. On the contrary, having new citizens is very much part of our effort to take care of Singaporeans. There's another aspect which I think is bare, worth for all of us to bear in mind, especially the younger ones in this room. I mentioned about the age of global uncertainty and the age of disruption. One important way that Singaporeans can excel and thrive in this world, in this age of uncertainty, is to make sure that we grow up in a multiracial, multireligious, multilingual society. And that ought to give us a very high degree of cultural sensitivity. All over the world, we have differences. Even when you travel, you have to carry different adapter plugs, right? because some are two pins, some are three pins, some are square, some are round. And that Singaporeans should be like the you know, adapter plug that we carry all over. Wherever we go to, we can plug in and draw energy and uh, link up with all. And Having that cultural sensitivity, having that respect for people from all over the world will give us a very, very special edge, especially in a world where people are turning inwards, in a world where people are less, less willing to cooperate. I think if Singaporeans can extend a hand, we can be bridge builders in a more fragmented world. And the key point is that we, whatever we do, must be to take care of Singaporeans and of Singapore's future. But if we take a narrow nativist approach and say that well, let's keep out the world, let's keep out trade, let's keep out other people, then I think eventually Singapore will wither. I'm Leong Man Wai from the Progress Singapore Party, we have talked a lot about diversity. And diversity is something that is a norm, you know, as our society develops. Given that Parliament already have NCMP and uh, the nominate, nominated uh, MP scheme, is there a plan or is there a consideration to actually uh, 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 move into a proportional representation in our parliament. Every system we look at, you'll find that there are issues. There are no perfect systems. And whether you end up with PR, proportional representation or not, does it lead to a better airing of views? It may or may not. But what is important is that, as, we, as uh, Ambassador Zainu mentioned earlier, how do we ensure that different viewpoints can be brought to the discussions in our public discourse. If we open our minds 
you find that there are plenty of different opinions that are being aired in Singapore and around the world. You have access to the internet, you have access to uh, the global newspaper all over, and you see that that proliferation of views is not uh, missing. But what is important is that we don't end up with polarization. Good morning, DPM and Mr. Devon. I'm Gabby Ho. I'm from UWCSA as well. Um, so my question is actually in relation to the law on gay marriage and why we can't make it legal yet, because it seems like the rest of the world has gone that way. It seems like, um, you know, Singapore is aiming to be a very accepting state. We're aiming to be more accepting of people from different cultures, of different backgrounds, of different beliefs. So why is it that we can't um, give the LGBT community the respect that they deserve yet? Okay, got it. Actually, you want to go straight to gay marriage, bypassing 377A. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle. Uh, good morning, DPM. Uh, my name is Elvin. I'm from uh, the National University of Singapore. I have two questions with regards to the substance of the Singapore Together movement. Uh, so the first question is, from the bird's eye view, it seems that Singapore Together movement seems like uh, our Singapore Conversation 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate pragmatically, practically, um, concretely speaking, what does Singapore Together Movement entail in terms of uh, how citizens are going to get their policy inputs? Okay. Uh, and number two, very quickly, um, is also to what degree do, will citizen inputs be actually considered uh, by the various government agencies? So, for example, if there's a consensus from among the citizens, for example, to abolish 377A, will the government do it? If there's a consensus among citizens to not increase GST, will the government do it? So first on, on Gabby's questions about you know, whether we will make gay marriage, uh, why can't we make gay marriage uh, legal? Now, in the, there has been, and I think IPS itself has done some study, right? On yeah. the views of this. Janela, you want to touch on that? Yeah. No, I, well, yeah. the, the proportion of people who approve, not gay marriage, but uh, um, abrogating 377A has been growing, but they are still a minority. Yeah. More young people are in favour than the general population. Yeah. So, so this is an issue that, mm -hmm. uh, where our society has mm -hmm. no consensus on this. Mm -hmm. right? And in fact, there are many more people mm -hmm. who are against this than people who are supportive of mm -hmm. this. Uh, that said, I think, you know, we... The, uh, uh, in terms of the citizens' ability to interact with others, to uh, uh, have a job and so on, is not uh, diminished. But what is important is that it, for certain issues for which where views are so different, it is for us to hold that uh, social consensus. And over time, views may evolve. And, uh, but it, what is important is not for groups to go on a confrontation, because when we do, then I think the views will be even more polarised. I believe that you know, views will change over time, and we will have to build that. And even that, it is not the case that all over the world, you know, everybody has changed their rules. The second question about, uh, from uh, our student Alvin at Yale NUS, concretely, what, uh, what is the difference between our Singapore conversation and Singapore together? Well, Singapore conversation, as the word suggests, is conversation. Right. So people talk, we share our views, we get a better understanding. So I think that sharing of views and perspective is useful. But I hope that Singapore together goes beyond the sharing of views, which is it goes towards action. It goes towards what Mr. Rajarana many years ago talked about, a democracy of deeds. A democracy, a good democracy is not just that people go to parliament and say, you know, let's do A, B, C and all that. And, but rather, it is one where every citizen does his or her part to make life better for everyone. Is I think that the young gentleman who asked the question about um, SG Together and uh, the spirit of the question was, are there taboo subjects? And the example he gave was 377A. Would the government be prepared to engage on 377A if it came up? Ah. Um, the answer actually was the question was asked earlier and it was answered by, um, by Ms. Indrani um, uh, mm -hmm. some weeks ago. And the answer is yes, of course, we will engage 
the government is prepared to engage, or at least that's what um, she said. Um, I'm surprised there's only 28 days left before you announce the budget, and the question has not come up, so I will ask you this question, and we can one minute to answer. Is it going to be a GE budget? <laughs> You can make news. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, is it going to be a GE budget? It, it surely depends on when GE is called, right? Because I think the Prime Minister can call for the GE in the latest by April 2021. So uh, there may still be another budget in February 2021. But jokes aside, I think what, what is important to consider is that it is important to mm -hmm. think of our budget mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as uh, mm -hmm. you know, a goodie bag mm -hmm. that people look forward to. Yeah. The, uh, I, you know, over the weekend, I was uh, in some mm -hmm. ground, uh, grassroots events, and many of mm -hmm. them happened to be, we were launching this uh, Chinese New Year festivity and right in the center was the big god of fortune. And then they say, oh, and then we had a god of fortune uh, following us on some of these events. And some residents started saying that, oh, the real god of fortune is there. Because you'll be giving Hong Pao. And I said that, you know, if you look at the traditional gods of fortune, it is a roly-poly figure, right? Full of uh, a big size, full of fats, therefore ready to give things away. But this is quite a skinny one. <laughs> really, what we have to consider that the budget is not, is really a financial plan that supports a more strategic plan for Singapore's future. Many of the things that we invest in our budget, whether it's to restructure the economy, to provide better opportunities for our people, mm. helps us to build capabilities, not just in a one or two years, but over the long term. So, for instance, if you look at our budget for economic uh, upgrading for workers' mm -hmm. training, it has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. And we have to think of ways in which the resources of the country is put to the best use mm -hmm. for our long-term future. It mm -hmm. is not a short-term giveaway mm -hmm. because that would not help us to build the capability to grow and prosper and to allow our people to have a better life. But in other areas for which there are groups of people who will need special support, for which we should think about how best we can support them in this journey, then I think we have to consider what specific measures may be helpful. Thank you, DPM. Yeah.